And so, I was born. The first people I remember seeing, were the old man, the old lady, and their daughter, Heather. After they'd said hello, the old man powered me down, so he could install some software. I could tell they were nice people. The old man didn't give me a silly voice, or stupid personality. And the old lady didn't dress me like a clown. Although for some reason, Heather really didn't like me. Once I'd had time to get used to walking, the old man asked me to dash from one end of the room to the other. Next, the old man spent a couple of hours building some wooden platforms, he said he wanted me to jump up them, but I must admit, I was scared. It wasn't until I saw Heather and her mother happily climbing up them, that I decided it might be okay. The old man then rearranged the platforms. He told me to try to reach the other end of the room without touching the floor. Heather said, the floor's made of lava. But when I smiled at her, she just frowned and looked away. The old lady arranged some pillows and blankets. She said it was in case I fell, but I think she just wanted it to look more like lava. I reached the other side. The old man just smiled and said, that'll do, for now.
A couple of days after those first lessons, the family had a big meal, and I was introduced to everyone else. The professor was the old man's brother. He was very quiet, and always seemed to just, kind of stare at me. He had lived with the old man for five years. The house was so huge they barely saw each other. He preferred instead to stay in his room, leaving everything up to his butler. Mr. Deck. As he insisted everyone call him, although the professor always called him Anton. For a while, he called me the yellow bastard. But the old man made him stop, as he thought it sounded racist. Mr. Silton was the old man's driver. Before he worked here he'd gotten in with some bad people and was the driver in a post office robbery, although it all went wrong for some reason. Mr. Silton showed me a video of his band. I'm sure some people must like it, but I just found it terrifying. Then there was Alice. She was the cook. She was a nice old lady. When she was younger she had been a TV chef. Then, years later she had a small part in Coronation Street. Mr. Silton said, before she worked for the old man, Alice was quite a hoarder. She kept old newspapers and bicycles. And something about a pool, in a shoebox. The next morning, the old man gathered everyone together, to show them what I was capable of. What else does he do? asked Mr. Silton. The old man smiled. He can help around the house. Could he help me with my newspaper collecting? asked Alice. I'm not sure that's a good idea, said the old lady, but he can do all sorts of jobs. Yeah, said Mr. Silton, shove a stick up his ass and he can do Dick's job. Now now, said the old man, we have company, pointing to some important looking people. Two large men, both called Gary, set up what the old man referred to as lasers. He said again, I should try to get from one end of the room to the other, but I shouldn't be worried, as I had a special chip which meant no matter how damaged I was, I couldn't die. He said it was like infinite lies in a video game. But when he realized I didn't understand, he said he would explain another time. Everybody clapped, except the important looking men. Not exactly a cold calculated killer, is it? Said the man in black. The man in grey laughed. What kind of artificial intelligence was that, he asked. Move right, unless there's something in the way. Okay okay, said the old man. He turned to me and whispered, they're going to make it quite a bit tougher but I'm sure you'll be fine.
The Garys then rearranged the room one last time, the old man smiled. Now now, there's no need to look so glum, he said. I'm still happy with everything you've done today. So this time, I was determined to do him proud. The old man's friends actually seemed quite happy when I made it through. We might have a winner after all, said the man in black. It's no kill by 3000, but you can almost see the fire in its eyes. A couple of days later, the old lady said she had a surprise for me, my own room. She also wanted to play me some music. I wasn't sure after what Mr. Silton had shown me.
As if music wasn't amazing enough, the old lady then bought me a television set. I couldn't believe what I saw, I watched everything I could. Comedy, drama, horror, sci-fi. Anything anyone wanted to watch I would happily watch with them. Then one day, the old man set up a small box, he plugged some cables into the television, and said, this is what I meant, when I said video games. I played games at every chance I could. I took on everyone. I was unstoppable. I had enjoyed music, film, and television. But to me, video games really were the highest art form. Heather's birthday was a couple of months later. Her mum and dad had bought her a camera and arranged a day up by the sea so that Heather could take some photos, although I really don't think she wanted any pictures of me. When the old man asked the professor if he wanted to go, he frowned and said, I can't believe you want to spend time with that thing, it could destroy the world. I wasn't sure what he meant, but the old man just smiled and said, that's what you said about the Game Boy. Anton, how about you? I don't think so, said Mr. Deck. The last time I got in that car, Barry crashed us into a branch of Woolworths. I never would have gone into Woolworths of my own accord. The old man explained that the car was old and the brakes had failed, but Mr. Deck was having none of it. So Mr. Silton drove, and Alice came along for the fresh air. I enjoyed being outside. Although, the old lady kept telling me to be careful of the rickety old walkways. It felt like she was telling me off, but I think she was just concerned. As the old man and I stood on the clifftops, I could see something in the distance. I wasn't sure what it was, so I asked the old man. He said it was a battleship that had sunk in the 1940s. But he looked so sad when he spoke about war. I didn't see what happened, but the metal platform Heather was climbing on had collapsed. She was safe, even if the rocks she was on looked very dangerous. The tide was rising, and we didn't know how long the Coast Guard was going to be. So I offered to climb down and get her. The old man agreed. 
but said I should be careful, as Heather doesn't have infinite lives, like I do. Heather was unconscious, and her leg was broken. So I picked her up as gently as I could. I decided it would be best if I didn't run the rest of the way. ambulance had arrived by the time I had made it back to the cliff top. The medics made sure Heather was okay, and then took her off to hospital. A few days later, we all went to see how she was doing. She was fine, but would have to wear the cast for a couple of months. Once Heather got to know me, we became good friends. We enjoyed the same films and TV. She was also annoyingly good at some of my favorite games. After a while, she became very interested in how I worked. Soon she knew as much about me as the old man did. If not more. We spent the next couple of months visiting other countries, as when it came to teaching me things, the old man always liked to pick interesting locations. He had explained the basics of mathematics to me at the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Taught me history in the dead of night, surrounded by mysterious giant stones. And even showed me science in action high up in a hot air balloon. This is why I was surprised when the old man took me to a restaurant. It was nice, but it seemed very somber compared to the previous grand locations. He said he just wanted to chat, and this was nice and quiet. Plus it was his favorite place to eat. We talked about life, the universe, Douglas Adams, everything really. When I asked him why were we here, why did we exist? He just smiled and said, life is like a game, just don't expect to be finished anytime soon. When I looked puzzled, he said, well, everyone should have a purpose. So I asked him, what's my purpose? He thought for a bit, then said, 
So you want to be a real boy? Which just confused me even more. Eventually the old man said, For now, I want you to help clean things around the house. I must have looked unimpressed. As he then said, Okay. I want you to clean. One million things. It didn't sound like the meaning of life. But I suppose you've got to start somewhere. The next day, the old man said he wanted to install some more software, so he powered me down. When I came to, he said Mr. Silton had a joke for me, and that I should pull his finger. I don't think I got the joke. So the old man powered me down again. This time when I pulled Mr. Silton's finger, I got the joke. But it wasn't very funny. The old man then explained that he had installed a special chip which allowed me to clean away anything that was broken. He said it also tells me how many things are nearby. And how many smaller things are in a bigger thing. It all sounded very complicated. But he said all I really had to do was, pause, and it would bring up all the information I needed. He then said he wanted me to find and clean all of the items in the room. He told me there would be some chains to climb, but that would be nice and easy, as I just had to press up. He then finished by saying, when I had collected all the items, I should come back here.
The old man then asked the old lady Heather and I to follow him outside. I was happy too, as it was a lovely hot day. The old man said he was worried that Alice had been hoarding again. She had filled up a small barn with old bicycles and newspapers. Heather said, this would be a perfect chance to properly test my new powers. The old man thought for a second, then said, using the Steptoe chip, I should find and clean, at least 300 things. When we explained to Alice what we wanted to do, she seemed scared. But after the old lady kindly explained that, well, the barn was starting to smell. She said it would be okay. One last thing, said the old man. If you want to use a door, just push up. When I was about to enter the old barn, Mr. Silton said he had seen some mushrooms growing inside. He asked me to give him any that I found, he then winked, but I wasn't sure why. The old man was very happy with everything that I had cleaned. But I think Mr. Silton was even more happy with his mushrooms.
It wasn't the days getting shorter, or the evenings getting colder. It was the falling leaves that really made me feel sad. As we watched the trees blowing in the breeze, the old lady said, the leaves must fall before the blossom comes. She had already explained the seasons to me, so for once, I actually understood. But it didn't make me feel any better. The old lady obviously heard enough of my moping, and said, right, next week we're going to have a party. For some reason she insisted that we were all going to wear costumes, Heather was very excited and said, I've got some perfect ideas. It was terrifying. Everyone was dressed like someone else. I think I was meant to be some kind of pumpkin, as everyone kept shouting, It's the great pumpkin. Still, at least Mr. Silton was having fun telling everyone his joke. And I suppose Heather's costume was quite flattering. After what seemed like forever, everybody left, and things got back to normal. Heather was allowed to watch a scary film before she went to bed, but I had to help Alice and Mr. Deck clean up. To get you, I wasn't happy about this, but the old man said if I was quick, then I could watch the end of the film with them. Alice was vacuuming, and Mr. Deck was taking down the decorations, so I thought I should clean up the plates and glasses. The ear-splitting sound was the fire alarm. As usual Mr. Deck, blamed Mr. Silton, saying he was probably smoking one of his jazz cigarettes. But then the professor appeared. He said that there was something burning in the kitchen. Alice looked confused, saying that she hadn't cooked anything since the morning. We were all surprised when Mr. Deck opened the oven. Inside was a large black cloak and a slightly burnt pair of men's underwear. Suddenly the old lady burst in. She looked terrified. She kept shouting, there's someone on the roof. When we went outside, it slowly became obvious that it was Mr. Silton. He was completely naked, and playing his guitar. He shouted down, when I finish this song, I'm going to fly. The old lady said, oh my god, I know this one, there's only about 30 seconds left. The old man then quickly turned to me and said, you know what to do.
By the time I had made it up to the roof, Mr. Silton was beside the edge. I tried to calm him down. But he was acting even more bizarre than usual. After an hour or so, Mr. Silton was fine. He said he had eaten some bad magic mushrooms. Part of me wondered why he hadn't doubled in size. Still, he was soon laughing and joking with the paramedics. One of them said he looked like the world's worst clown. I don't think Mr. Silton liked that. So he told his own joke. But that just made the other paramedic call him Marshmallow Marso. I don't think he liked that either. But at least he was still in one piece. A month or so later, Heather and I were playing video games. When the old man said he wanted me to come outside. He said it had been a year since I had arrived. So, he had a present for me. He placed the teddy bear high up on a wooden platform, he then told me I should try to pick it up. <laughs> try as I might, I couldn't reach the teddy bear. However, I still don't understand what happened next.
Was I dead? Was this heaven? It sort of looked like the basement bathroom. It was the shoes the old man was going to give me. I thought I might as well put them on. They were just the right size. The old man's hat fit me pretty good as well. I'm sure he wouldn't mind if I wore it. Amazingly, the shoes allowed me to defy gravity. Or maybe it was the hat. Part of the basement was flooded, and the stairs had collapsed. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew I wanted to get back upstairs. The gate was locked. I would need a key to open it. I had to be careful, the electricity was going haywire in some places. How long had I been asleep? Months? Years? I was so confused. Where had everybody gone? I was slightly scared. This was the first time I had been outside on my own. I knew what I had to do, this had to be my purpose. I would clean a million things, so I could become a real boy. Whatever that meant.
The screaming was coming from one of the bedrooms, but the stairs were blocked by a wall of fire. screaming turned out to be a man, a woman, and their children. They were confused and terrified. At first the man looked like he was ready to fight me, but after I convinced them that I was there to help, he calmed down. There was no way I could carry them all at once, so the children went first. I dropped the children off at the front door, and promised them that I would be back with their parents. fire was getting much worse. So the woman went next. When we got to the front door, all the woman said was, thank you, please hurry. By the time I managed to get back, the man was unconscious. I had to pick him up quickly, as I could tell the house was going to collapse at any moment.
I helped the family set up a tent so they had somewhere to stay. The kids were excited as they got to camp outside, but I think they knew they had just lost their home. When I mentioned my quest to clean a million things, the man said I should look through the rubble of the house, as they had no use for it. So, when everyone was making dinner, I looked through the wreckage. There wasn't anything I could clean, but to my astonishment, I found a TV set and a games console. With a bit of fiddling I was able to get them to work. So I sat playing games with the kids until their parents said it was bedtime. As we talked, the man opened a bottle of wine. I asked what had happened, why was everything so ruined? The man looked at the woman, then the woman sighed and said, There was a war. Yes. A war, said the man. One side of the planet attacked the other, and before we knew, it was all over. Everything gone. Everything destroyed. Well, it's late, said the woman. We should really get some sleep. Help yourself to anything you need, and we'll see you tomorrow. In the morning, I asked the man if he knew what had caused the fire that had destroyed their house. The man smiled, crap old house, bad wiring, constant electrical surges from the unreliable power plant, take your pick. He said, if we had the money, we'd move to the mainland. But we can barely feed ourselves, let alone buy a new house, so for now we're left here with the rest of the scum. But he did say I should head to the mainland, as there would be plenty there for me to clean, and a better quality of rubbish. The man said, before the war, my lovely wife used to be a fisherman. Fisherwoman? Fishing person? I used to catch fish, interrupted the woman, and, seeing as you saved us all from the fiery end, maybe you would like to borrow my boat to get to the mainland. I was a little scared. But then they gave me some captain software and I was an old salty sea dog within minutes. <laughs>